Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Flight Simulator X. This is air hauler, but I'm not going to show the air hauler window. Uh, you can see that I've got a new plane. This is the Beechcraft Baron B-58. You can see that I'm dealing with air traffic control at the moment because I'm doing something a bit stupid and kind of fun actually. So what I'm doing is this, it's a six leg flight. Today's leg is Jenkins Airfield, which is a grass strip in Fremont, Ohio in America. Uh, to Ogdensburg International Airport in New York, also in America, because I bought this Beechcraft and air hauler second hand. Now, I've done the type rating before uh, the video started, and here we go, take off. Not very good at taking off of grass strips. You can see the planes bouncing about everywhere. Pop the nose down, and up we go into the air. There we go. So, it's a six-leg flight, and there will be music. Uh, no in-game sound at all because I was recording it while I was on TeamSpeak at night because these flights this one in uh, on its own if I can bring up the file here real quick and get the details properties is uh, why will not tell me one hour this is one hour 17 minute long flight real time uh, I think I put on time acceleration for a lot of it as well but it was not a short flight um, and this is the shortest flight that I did um, the rest were a lot more lengthy uh, the reason that it's six legs is basically because I didn't have enough fuel you can see that I'm flying IFR instrument flight rules kind of familiarizing myself with the plane a bit and out to the flyby camera we go now like I said this is sped up massively um, and I was on TeamSpeak for recording all of this, just for the sake of uh, my own sanity. <laughs> Here's me trying to figure out how the autopilot works, and trying to just <laughs> trying to figure out if I can get it to work the way that I want it to. Um, yeah, no, that's not how the autopilot works. Annoyingly, the autopilot is the kind, and you'll see me pop it up on screen here in a minute. The kind where you have to have the window open all the time and manually change the headings. You can see that I'm getting really frustrated by it at this point. And this is four times normal speed. There we go. I figured out that you actually need to. Well, I figured out that you need to do some of the headings. Um, and it's just cleared me up to my cruise altitude of 10,000 feet. So, the Beechcraft Baron. It is a twin prop plane. Uh, it is twin radial, in fact, so it's an air-breathing prop plane. It's not a uh, turbojet or or turboprop, even, which is basically a turbojet. Um, and I still haven't figured out the... Wow, I was really slow at figuring out the autopilot on this, I've just realized. Um, this is kind of my familiarization flight, even though I did three test flights with it already. Uh, all of which were my rating flight, which I crashed twice, because I I didn't realize the first few times. Um, ah, here we go. Now I've figured out that the... Uh, yeah, this is me figuring out that the radio is incredibly difficult to control on this. Um, basically, on my rating flights, the first two or three, I couldn't figure out how to land the plane. Um, I was trying to fly it like the Comanche, which was a bad idea because number one it has double the engines number two the engines are a completely different place um, and that might not sound like it makes much of a difference the you know the engines being a different place the engines being a different place means it has different aerodynamic characteristics and in the beach instead of what I was doing in the Comanche which was gradually bringing the throttle down the further down and the closer to the ground I was in the beach, you have to do the exact opposite. You have to power up as you're coming into land. Um, because the aerodynamic surfaces actually require the props to be turning at quite a high rate for them to work. Uh, so that was fun and interesting. Now, these flights are all quite long. Uh, I will tell you that <laughs> this flight, um, while it was an hour 70 minutes real time for me, I didn't even leave the US. And uh, the destination overall here, I'm not going to reveal every every uh, leg right now, but the destination <laughs> overall is Waterford Airport in Ireland. So 
This is a transatlantic beachcraft journey. Uh, this is what uh, I re would really actually probably happen if you wanted to bring a beachcraft from Jenkins Airfield, Fremont, Ohio to Waterford Airport, County Waterford, Ireland. You wouldn't be able to do it in one go. The plane doesn't just doesn't have the range. So you'd do it in legs. Um, you'd need to get to the edge of the Atlantic and then you'd need to get over the Atlantic, which isn't exactly a single jump in a beach craft. So, yeah. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually leave you guys right now to some music and uh, the cruise, seeing as I've just noticed on the altimeter on the plane that we're reaching up near 10,000 feet. And I'll be back with you guys uh, for the approach, which granted will be sped up. Um, and you get to see the joys of Flight Sim ATC, uh, where... Actually, no, it wasn't this leg. It was the final leg. The ATC started having a massive argument with itself over who I should be contacting. Um, it actually behaved quite nicely up until then. But uh, you'll see you'll see some funny stuff going on as I... Or some weird stuff. There's me figuring out the autopilot. Yeah, you'll see some weirdness happening as I uh, get closer to my destination and I start getting vectored in. And I'll... Be back with you guys then.
So there is our first approach call. Yes, and that's the game back down to normal speed. Uh, well, in-game. It's still actually accelerated for you guys. Um, so now the ATC is going to start vectoring us in and giving us different directions. And you might notice something that it, it keeps giving the same two. Uh, it's something that's bizarrely... It's very rigor in, in, in FSX with ATC. Um, and while I do have an add-on for the ATC, it, it doesn't really help with the vectors. Um, so what Flight Sim does is it likes zigzagging you in. It likes you going in straight lines and kind of shifting over a bit every so often. And as a result, it doesn't give you like a vector to go to was uh, uh, this waypoint right here. Well, it will if you ask for a, a waypoint landing. If you're getting a vector to runway landing, it won't say, you know, go this heading uh, and just stay on it until we give you like a 90 degree turn or a 45 degree turn. This is where I've realized, by the way, that this leg is very, very short for the plane. Um... Yeah, I just noticed the fuel is just under a quarter of a tank used. And I'm trying to make the most of the fuel, so... Having gone nowhere near the... the basically the reserves and the low fuel area, um, this flight is a bit short. Um, because I just never didn't have an idea of the fuel range of the plane. I, I managed to figure it out pretty well. Uh, by leg three or four. Um, air hauler wasn't helping much because it was saying the fuel range was much less than it was. There's some more flybys. The beautiful Beechcraft. Oh, giving another turn. But, um, oh no, that was my descent. My initial descent. Uh, down to... I can't, I can't quite see it. I'm only looking at a small preview, so I can't quite see it. Uh, this is me figuring out that there's different controls to see how much fuel I'm using. And playing about that a bit. Um, but the one thing that kind of annoys me about FSX, and this is big annoyance, it's something that I, I wish there was an add-on to fix, um, other than using like VATSIM or uh, IVAO or Pilot Edge or any one of the trillion different, you know, human ATC alternatives is. The vectoring is terrible. It doesn't tell you go, we'll say, fly heading 350, and then 20 minutes later it tells you fly heading as uh, 040. And gives you, you know, giving you logical vectors in where you just fly the one heading, you'll go straight up to a point, it'll give you a vector to another point, and then a vector to the runway. Uh, in FSX notes, fly heading 010, fly heading 030. 010, 030, and it'll zigzag you in and kind of step you in, which I don't know if real world air traffic controllers would ever really want to do that because it makes no sense. It makes, it, you know, it, it increases their workload, and it's something that is just wasteful. Time-wise, it's, it's much easier to just say, hey, plane, go in a straight line for like six miles, please. Um, instead of every... And it's, it's it really depends on where exactly the plane is, uh, how bad it gets. But I've had it where I spent five minutes just constantly being like, okay, go this, go that, go this, go that. And then it shouted at me because I was too high because it never told me the altimeter changed. Um, also, you might notice the altimeter is in millimeters of mercury. Or, is it millimeters of mercury? Inches of mercury, even. No. Yeah, it, uh, inches of mercury. As opposed to hectopascals. Um, that's because you can't really change it in FSX, and that's kind of an annoyance. If you change it to uh, the metric system, which is what's used in... Uh, even Europe, in, in the UK, and whatnot. And you, if you listen to... ATZ and you're around Europe, they'll say QNH 1016. Instead of, uh, well, number one, even in America, they'll usually say QNH. But instead of like 29 or 9 or 2 or something like that, that's something that always annoys me is you can't just change the unit for the altimeter. If you change the altimeter to be metric, um, you change every measurement to be metric. 
and ATC doesn't really deal with metric measurements. It will tell you a distance in feet to be up above the ground at all times. And I have no idea what that is in meters. Um, so it gets really complicated really quickly and it's just kind of easier to just use, as much as I dislike it, the imperial measurements. Um, as opposed to the correct measurements. <laughs> because, it, like, in air travel um, and flying in general, for those of you who don't know, and I'm presuming there's some here who, who are just watching for me and thinking that I'm going to be mental and not actually having a vaguely serious series for once. Um, for those of you that don't know, in air travel, um, distances are handled in feet above the ground and in nautical miles from a point. Um, and that's because it's just the way that it's always worked. It's just a traditional way. It's better that it's uniform across the world instead of, we'll say, a plane flying from Ireland to New York having to magically, halfway across the Atlantic, change all the instruments to be imperial units instead of metric. Or plane flying from London to New York over Ireland having to change from imperial to metric and then back to imperial. Um, it it's just easier to use kind of st standard measurements, and most Q and H's, most altimeters can handle both. Um, for some reason, this Beechcraft, for I don't know why, it uh, is that telling me what the runway is? I think that's the call for the runway. Yeah, I'm looking for the runway. I think I've seen it. Yep, that was me seeing the runway. So we're on final approach now, and I think this is a. Ogdensburg International, it has to be a controlled airport. <laughs> there is no way that Ogdensburg International is not a controlled airport. So here we are in final approach now with the Beechcraft. Uh, lovely Baron B-58. It's uh, quite it's quite nice to fly. It kind of flies on wheels. It's not as lively as the um, as the, the Cherokee or Comanche that I was using. I keep calling it a Cherokee. It's not as lively as the Comanche. Um, it seems to respond a lot quicker to some inputs. You can kind of see it jiggling about as I, I make slight changes in my input and that, that's it responding just immediately instead of having kind of a delayed response. Um, and at low speeds it, it does have a habit of trying to stall itself quite a lot. Um, you can see the, the speedometer there just kind of falling and falling and falling as the flaps come in and the gear is out. And it just, it produces so much drag once it's in landing configuration that it just wants to stop on the runway. Um, which I guess is nice, but it's a bit of a pain trying to fly it in. Because, it, look, the speedometer is just going down and down and down. I think I realized that at some point and just throttle up fully. Because it's a plane that wants to stall itself onto the runway all the time. It just wants to, to stall. And, uh... Yeah, not fun. Um, fun to fly, not to land. But here we go, landing on the runway right about now in the touch zone. zone. There we go. Brakes on. Full brakes, because I don't trust myself. More brakes, and we are pulling off the runway. We come to, oh, we come to a stop because I want to get this into taxi configuration. It's something I kept forgetting to do, was change configurations from taxi to, to flight. Um, sounds easy, but you got to turn off the landing lights, turn on the taxi lights, turn off the beacon, not the beacon, the strobe, um, and kind of turn on the dome light, which I didn't turn off at all during this flight, as it happens. Um, you might notice I've been flying at night, and the next flight is, I think, at night as well. Oh, no, I started during the day, landed at night. Um, and yeah, that's FSX kind of going through time. Uh, one thing that has changed since then is uh, last night, for me, two nights ago, I bought Ground Services X. So, um, not in future videos here, but in streams, upcoming streams, hint, hint, uh, you'll see me landing and then opening a new window and getting like a follow me car out or maybe just um, looking at a separate window that I have that'll give me airport, airport layouts. But what we're doing here is we're taxiing over to the uh, fuel depot. 
because we need fuel. That's going to do it for now. Hope you enjoyed. I'll be back tomorrow with uh, another leg of this journey. Uh, tomorrow's leg is Ogdensburg International to Goose Bay, Newfoundland, Canada. Until then, stay safe and goodbye.